listening to the Insight to Action podcast. My name is Donna Jones, and today what we're going to be talking about is the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. Now, a lot of people think that uh, self-management and, and man- management and business innovation is a new thing, but Beyond Budgeting has been around for a lot longer than that, and so I'm really delighted today to be talking to Franz Rosli in Zurich, Switzerland, about his role as the core team member of BBRT and and to really share with you what's the journey that BBRT has been on, uh, what, what kind of, of things have been learned along the way and and what observations certainly Franz has with respect to what what uh, is going on in the area of business man, and management innovation. So Franz, welcome to the program. A pleasure to talk with you about the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. Let's start with a little bit more detail on who you are and what what your work and how you got involved in this area of the field of business and management innovation. I started my university life 15 years ago. Beforehand, I was 15 years uh, as uh, as uh, within normal, regular uh, company life in different positions, also in the executive team. With my start at the university, um, I come across with this Beyond Budgeting Roundtable that um, got my interest and uh, had the luck to join this research and practitioner community. Uh, the question that was behind 20 years ago when this uh, roundtable was built was how to improve the problems almost all companies have with budgeting. So that was the very first approach to give insight, practical insight to get, uh, uh, get rid of the problems of budgeting. That's why it is called Beyond Budgeting, Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. What's the history behind it? What my friends, the founders of the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable found out is that uh, there are some very few companies not using this traditional approach of planning. Um, But what they also found out when they were looking for such kind of companies, and they found, finally, some of them, uh, that they did not abandon budgeting as the uh, the self-aim. These companies um, do have a completely different organizational and leadership approach with a consequence of not having the traditional budgeting approach. That was a real uh, important insight in this, in this practical, in this field research. These companies are organized and led completely in a different way that most companies on the planet with, with the abandoning of budgeting as a consequence. So it's much more about leadership and organization than isolated finance aspects. That's very important to know about Beyond Budgeting. Mm -hmm. Four years ago, you and I offline were talking about uh, meeting up with Frederick Laloux and and, uh, Doug Kirkpatrick and others. What have you seen evolve since since, certainly since Reinventing Organizations came out, but, but also in terms of what their growth is with respect to organizations that are not, you know, following the mainstream line of thought and they're actually doing things differently. I, I think that was a very important contribution, uh, Frederick Lalu's reinventing organizations. We have a lot of things in common between what he's calling teal and beyond budgeting, but also other concepts that are discussed like radical management. There is a huge overlap um, in this, uh, within these concepts. Uh, I mean, they all are addressing self-organized, self-organization. That's really um, the, the, the point. And we do identify uh, independently the same companies, like, for example, Morningstar. We call Morningstar a beyond budgeting organization. Uh, Frederick Lalou is, is calling Morningstar, Morningstar a teal organization. I think it was very crucial. Frederick just hit the nerve in, in the society. What beyond budgeting, probably because of the name, did not do as much as reinventing organizations because probably it addresses too much the finance-oriented people only. So thanks very much, for example, to Freddy Cladou to have induced this uh, discussion in a very well, in a very well way and gave, gave momentum 
to that important issue to think about leadership and organization. What kinds of, of companies do you find are, are showing up at BBRT? What, what's drawing them to the conversation around innovation? Because it sounds like we've, we've got a lot of interest in management innovation and the example you just gave with Frederick Lelou and the Morningstar innovations that date back to Morningstar has been doing things differently since for 20 something years now. So what kinds of companies are you seeing showing up that are expressing a real interest in, in, in following or, or becoming a, a BBRT kind of company, if you will? The interest still is many times by CFOs uh, in this concept because of the name. And uh, I think uh, so that's many, many times the entry point into, into an organizational transformation uh, from the finance side, uh, which I have to say is very important. I th what we see is that you cannot really transform an organization in leadership and organization without addressing also the budgeting process. So I think that's um, maybe a distinction between beyond budgeting and other concepts coming from the perspective of finance, of budgeting. We do address this process, which we think is very important if you really want to transform an organization. You have to tackle also this aspect, of course, not only this aspect, but also, which sometimes is a bit forgotten. So most people from finance want to tackle this process and finally they, they realize it cannot be done only with that. Once you start, you have to go and do all the different aspects that are connected to it. Budgeting is connected to organization. Budgeting is connected to leadership. So you have to address finally all the aspects of an organization. Well, I appreciate that because there's a lot of core services and organizations that get ignored in the reinvention process, and and it, and that can drag the organization back. It can act like a bit of an undertow when a company is trying to kind of become much more responsive to to the conditions that are both going on internally and externally. I find that interesting. On this podcast, and you know, I've also done an interview with Robin Ann Fitzgerald, who has in her energy in the energy company she worked for in Norway, basically they got rid of the budgeting process, which changed the dynamics and the decision making focus of the company quite radically. So I encourage listeners to have a, a listen to that conversation. Franz, can you give us more about if you're a member of the BBRT, if you show up to a BBRT meeting, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to speak to the round table last fall, I think it was in, in London. Anyway, can you give people an understanding of what's the experience, what's the value, uh, what kinds of practical things do people come away with that they can turn around and, and use to help their organizations become much more responsive? Yes, it's really about community. It's important that people can exchange, people from different companies can exchange with each other, talking about the same problems that they found transforming their organizations. So we are really a platform for exchange, for collaboration uh, and for uh, help each other. The meetings are a contact platform. They are uh, uh, an information base. Obviously, we have fantastic speakers as you uh, were last October. There are also workshops organized, but mainly it is really to meet each other and to, to have the, the space also to exchange about problems in progressing into the journey of uh, beyond budgeting. Having said that, besides these meetings we have, there are different types of meetings coming together, not only the, the members meeting, we have introductory meeting, we have uh, implementers meeting. Besides that, we have a huge database where all the members have the access to all the case studies, to all the papers, uh, all the uh, field research that um, has been made during the last 20 years. Wow. So let's talk a little about the context of BBRT and its and where it fits in the grander landscape of, of business and management innovation because, as you said, there's the teal, there's the entire self-management movement, which often gets lumped together with self-organizing, and I see those two as being a bit quite a bit different, actually. 
where does BBRT fit within the context of, you know, Teal, within the context of liberating organizations and Isaac Getz's work? How do you see, how do you see this, these things all relating to one another in some way? They do fit very much together. They have, as a core, they have self-organization. So um, I think they are highly related as modern organizational concepts coming from different perspectives. I think that's very important. That's very interesting. I think it's, it's so important that these different movements or these different concepts that they, they come together and exchange, you know, that we can learn from each other's because we have a very common ground, uh, but we have interesting details that uh, every concept addresses in another way because coming from other ways you know like we come from more a bit more more from finance agile comes a bit more from it so i think that's highly relevant uh, to go on this learning journey uh, all together and to contribute better solutions for for practitioners i mean i think one common ground is really the uh, human nature assumptions i think that's what unites us Without maybe even being conscious about it, I think we have a similar assumption about human nature which contradicts the unconscious human nature uh, assumptions that is uh, in mainstream management. In mainstream, mainstream management where we think um, that people um, need to be controlled, that they have to be said what, to, what, is being, what they have to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's uh, why we have this so-called command and control mainstream management model. And these newer approaches like TEAL, like radical management, self-management, uh, self beyond budgeting, the human nature assumptions are th the opposite. We, we do think that people want to contribute, that they are highly engaged given they have the right conditions in their companies. Can you give us some examples of companies that have, in your beyond budgeting, really put these principles and practices into play? Because I appreciate the value of a mastermind group, or sort of a community, a peer-to-peer -peer community, which provides us support. How does that result in people actually doing something different when they go home? I think one of the real benefits is in our community that members, company members, they join our meetings not as one person but two or three or four so it's not one person that just uh, is listening and is changing about all this stuff but several which uh, is fundamental to go back into companies and you do not have to explain to everybody else and nobody uh, was there you are a group you are a, you are a team that uh, have heard and exchange about the same thing and really helpful to ignite to ignite uh, something going on within the company. Of course, you have to be willing to do some changes. Only taking participating at the meetings definitely is not enough. There, there is support from us, from the core team members, and mutual support of of of, uh, of company members. You know, they they are in contact. They go into contact with each other. So it's an online and offline support system, if you will, that comes from BBRT members. Yes, yes. When I've been traveling, and, and I appreciate your comments about the speaking, but when you're when you're traveling and you come across people, I have a number of people that sort of say to me, "Look, I work for you know in the finance area, and it's hopeless. They're backwards. It's in in one of the sectors, and yet at the same time, we're starting to see some really interesting innovations in in Australia. Certainly, the, there's a lot of implementation of agile in bank." In terms of the kinds of innovations you're seeing going on in the financial sector, what, where, which companies are standing out? I think you and I talked about earlier about Hans Weichen. Which companies are standing out and why? What, 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 is the, what is driving innovation in, in that sector as a whole? I do not think that this sector uh, as a whole sector is very innovative. That's my personal point of view. But there are some exemplars that uh, are on an interesting journey. Uh, obviously, Handelsbanken, well, a fantastic case, a fantastic beyond budgeting case, is outstanding. They are, they are doing that uh, already fi almost 50 years ago. So I think it's, it's, it's their fundament, how they think about people. I come back to that. 
which is influential for everything that they do concerning leadership and organization and, uh, and to serve customers best. I think it's a mindset question. Having said mindset questions, I think it's all about the quality of awareness of people, of the leaders that uh, do want to change or transform an organization. It depends what they really think. Is it about more shareholder value, which I think is a problem? And I still see banks uh, going this way, doing more of the same old thing, you know. That's not change in my view. But there are a few examples that really want to change the way, also their identity, their self-understanding. But this needs mature leaders that really are really uh, wanting to go this way to serve the clients and society and not to put profit first. It's, It's really about philosophical aspect. Is it about purpose? Do the leaders think about purpose or do they only think about profit? That that makes a big, big difference. Well, I couldn't agree with you more on that. As most of my listeners know, that is a a major mantra that I carry with because as soon as you focus on purpose, you can actually make far better decisions. When you're focused on profit, it's it's much too narrow a frame and, and you simply can't see what's going on in the organization. It's almost like putting blinders on. Uh, exactly. I mean, it, I think it's the, the important uh, discussion about what are the ends or what is the end and what are the means. With profit maximization, you just pervert means and end, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that, uh, that is causing problems as we have, as we have seen it. And I think that's uh, really an important discussion to think about what is what is really the end and what are the means for an end. I do not have anything against profit, just to be um, right, you know. But profit, in my view, for a for a for an organization, is a, is a mean and not the end. Uh, companies need profit, but not as the sell fame. It's a means to an end, and uh, this is completely another position. It, absolutely, and this is where there's a lot of confusion because they, when they focus is on that profitability, they become irrelevant very quickly and, and create much more negative impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Let's go back a bit to the financial sector because I know when we're talking about beyond budgeting, somehow we end up steering back to that financial conversation just because of that word, budgeting. I appreciate what you said about mature leadership. When your listeners listen to the Robin Ann Fitzgerald interview about Removing budgeting, there's a lot of leadership involved in helping an organization think differently about what it's doing. And so when we go back to what you were saying earlier about mature leaders, if you are someone listening to this program, how would you know you've reached that level of maturity where you can actually guide and steer effectively? I think you cannot have a measure kind of external measure now i'm there i think i think it's it's a personal journey also to get a mature leader you know i think everybody if you want to have a change within an organization a real change you have to change yourself first uh, if you have an attitude uh, i'm already mature so I will change now the company. Maybe that's, that's, that's a, a mindset that um, is not helping. I think if you are in a, in a, in a company and you want to really transform, you have to start with yourself. Then maybe it's really honest. If you take you out of the transformation because you are already mature, you do not have to change, but all others have to change. And I see that many, many, very many times. I think uh, then um, the, the starting point is a failure. So this is a growth journey, if you will, and, you know, and a, and a releasing of own per, of personal potential. It is a growth journey for every individual, and of course, then also for the company. Yeah, yeah, multiple multiple layers there. Any particular recommendations when you you know when you look at what people are doing on the outside to help companies on the inside are you seeing anything you know any particular threads of uh, transformation that are working well i think an important point is that everybody that wanna see change should not wait 
if not being uh, at the top themselves, until the change comes from above. That's, uh, that's an argument I, I hear a lot. Yes, that's wonderful. We would like to go in this direction, but our top management uh, would never do that. That's, that's an excuse. That's not taking responsibility. If you want to change, do go forward in your realm of, um, of influence. Everybody, everybody has a realm of influence and start there. Start there with small experiments. Try. I mean, here Agile really comes into play. Try. If it does not work, try something else. If it works, try to continue, try to uh, evolve it. Other people will see it. If they like it, they also try. So I think that's, that's really important, not waiting for the big bang from above. I really appreciate that distinction or that, that uh, tip because that is something you hear a lot, and there's always a deferral of responsibility for taking leadership. It's like the, the executive will say, I can't get the, I can't get the middle, you know, I can't get any action from, from the organization or the, as you said, the other way around. So there's always this, it's somebody else's responsibility, and that's a good way of making sure nothing happens. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate the idea that get started. That's leadership. That's leadership, that's new kind of leadership, not leadership by position, but by example. That's what we are needing, you know. Yeah, and I also know that if you use methods, and I think I've talked about this in other programs, perhaps certainly have written about it, but when, when you use methods that respect the fact you're in a, a, a community of people, that you're in a community of relationships in an organization, and you use methods that work with that emotional social network, then there, it's extremely fast. It's much faster than you're going to find if you use a business process to intellectually wrangle down the issues. It's, it, these, these things happen when people want them to. They don't happen because, because the process dictates that it should be so. On the podcast, we have one interview with Chris Laszlo and Irvin Laszlo where Chris talks about a lot of the, the shifts in business. So, in other words, it's a quantum leadership role where you take where you are and you jump, make, you know, make some massive jump. Completely agree on that. Completely. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just an assumption that change has to, needs to be a long time, you know. That's an assumption that's maybe empirically true, but maybe it's empirically true because we did not try in another way. Exactly. I don't think that change as a, as a physical law has to take a long time. It depends on our assumptions. Well, exactly. And I, I know that for me, you know, when I look at some of the pain that organizations go through in their transformation and they work really hard and they get incremental results, it's because they're using linear thinking. They're thinking that if we mm -hmm. fix this here, that this will – they're still trying to predict outcomes. They're still trying to engineer outcomes and that's, that doesn't work in communities of complex relationships. It never has, it never will. But when you work with it from a, you know, from, from the, from the human center approach using, you know, emotional, social conversations, put it this way, if, if you've got, water coolers tend to be really good places where people resolve the issues that should have happened in meeting rooms. So <laughs> it's, it's, if you work with the emotional, social part of it, it's just going to be so much faster. But for some reason, engaging people in the visioning, engaging people in the decision making it is something that is not done by, it, when it's done by design, it, it really accelerates the shifts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same experience. One more question on the financial sector, if I may, Frost. Currently, right now, banks are considered to be uncaring and profit-focused and shareholder value. And if you look at the, when I do Google in Canada, the top five banks are the top five biggest companies. What, what's the history? Have we had caring banks in the past? That's definitely what I have in my memory, that banks had a, a very good reputation. Uh, as a boy, I remember banks were, were had a very good reputation in Switzerland. Uh, all the people thought very well about banks and the bankers 
caring not only for their profit, but they were they were part of society, and um, not only profit maximization was was the mindset. That's what I have in mind. So a very a very positive image about banks and bankers, and. I think it changed in the 70s or 80s when neoliberalism prevailed after Milton Friedman won Nobel Prize, you know, and uh, shareholder value maximization got to the got to the main mainstream, to the mainstream mindset what uh, what the purpose of a company should be. This is still uh, quite prevailing. This kind of mindset of profit maximization, especially, especially in the banking sector. After all, this crisis is still there. But in my view, that was not always there. It, it has to do with this shift to profit maximization in the economics and in the management science, which is still a problem today. So building on that, how do we create a renaissance, if you will, in that sector so that so that this attachment to the profitability is balanced off by a responsibility to society and to the community? Tough question. Tough questions. I don't know if the majority of banks are capable to change themselves. With the mindset they still have, I doubt it a little bit to, to, be, to be open. Maybe with the new people coming into the bank, I mean, they have to engage Generation Y. That could be a chance. But the leaders leading the banks at the moment uh, with this kind of mindset, um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit concerned to be true. On the other hand side, um, maybe, maybe there is, there is an, another game changer. And this is the new technologies like blockchain that the banks, uh, the traditional banks with their traditional business models uh, come under pressure and they have to change with this outside pressure coming uh, quite fast towards them. Um, but with the mindset they have in the banks, I do not really assume that they will change freely or independently. No, I'm with you on that. So the, this is where the real value of... of uh Emergent leaders comes to mind where you, we really need some bold leadership to, to help avert some sort of crisis at that sector. And we know that banks have quite capable of riding through crises as long as they have the government's support and, and there's no political will to hold them to task and make them accountable. But if, if there's acceptance of responsibility, then of course anything can happen. So. Yeah, absolutely. And having said all these quite critical words, there are exceptional banks. Absolutely. I mean, it, it is possible and there are exceptions. Yes. Yeah. And banks trying to be the exception as well. So is there anything coming up in, with respect to um, Beyond Budgeting, the BBRT, Beyond Budgeting Roundtable? Yes, of course. We will have our next meeting uh, uh, in October. Uh, 23rd and 24th of October in London and uh, very excited to come together there as community and of course we do welcome guests so it would be very nice to see new people joining us and contributing and exchanging with us at the next meeting. Franz, I want to thank you for being on the program and, and for our collaboration on things. I look forward to having more conversations. Thanks for joining me. Thanks very much, Donna. It was a pleasure. When I look at the variety of options across the landscape for being able to help or, you know, options, governance models, for example, uh, different ways of transforming, there's a lot of choice out there. So I do encourage you to listen to the full range of self-managed ex examples that I have in the podcast on my website under podcast the link there's just those listed there but um, also I encourage you to really start with yourself in terms of how are you are you ready are you ready to let go are you ready to be more creative are you ready to tap into more than who you are are you there's so many there's so much potential out there and yet I see so much fear and that seems to be the, the showstopper I'm looking forward to doing a workshop in Stockholm 
on uh, mindset and I hope you'll be able to join me there because it's very much around this personal growth journey that has to do with how do we work with complexity, how do we work with transformation in a more effective way. And you'll find that on agilepeoplesweden.com. Other than that, thank you very much for joining me and to look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Hope you're all having a great summer. Do find me at frominsighttoaction.com. My name is Donna Jones, D-A-W-N-A. Twitter, E-P-D-A-W-N-A underscore Jones. And on LinkedIn.